Good evening. On behalf of the Hopkins and Women's Club, I would like to welcome you to our 28th annual Meet the Candidates Night. My name is Nancy Clark, and I will be the moderator for this program. The Hopkins and Women's Club was founded in 1920, when women were gaining the right to vote. And each year, we organize this Candidates Night to aid all citizens as they determine who to cast a ballot for in the upcoming town election. We welcome new members to the Women's Club and encourage anyone interested in our community service organization to visit our website at www.hopkintonwc.com. I will now introduce the candidates in attendance tonight. For a seat on the Board of Library Trustees, Darlene Hayes, a Democratic Caucus nominee. For a seat on the Planning Board, Frank Durso, Democratic Caucus nominee. For two seats on the School Committee, Jean Birchman, candidate for re-election on nomination papers. John Graziano, candidate for re-election running on nomination papers. And Brian Karp, running on nomination papers and the Republican Caucus nominee. For one unexpired seat on the Parks and Recreation Commission, Laura Hansen, Democratic Caucus nominee, and Robert McGuire, running on nomination papers. And for a seat on the Parks and Recreation Commission, the full three-year term, Robert Dominski, candidate for re-election, and Republican Caucus nominee. We appreciate the fact that these candidates took time from their busy schedules to appear on this program. Some of them are in uncontested races, but realize that Hopkinton citizens are very interested in learning more about everyone who is running for office. So we thank you for attending tonight. We will begin with an opening statement from every candidate. Each person will have a time limit of two minutes for opening remarks. Our timers this evening will be student volunteers and members of the Women's Club. They will hold up a sign periodically to indicate how much time candidates have left. <clears throat> if necessary, they will ring a bell to signify the end of two minutes. Please hold your applause until all of the candidates have finished speaking. Now will the first group of candidates please step up to the podium. And Darlene, you may begin. Hi, I'm Darlene Hayes, and first I want to thank Nancy, the Women's Club, and HCAM for actually hosting this platform. It's actually pretty incredible that, one, we're live now and out there, but I'm running for um, a position on the Board of Trustees for the Library, and look forward to helping bring our library to the, supporting the library into the next millennium and all the new and exciting progress it's going to have. Thank you. Frank Durso, the Planning Board. Thank you, Nancy. I'm Frank Durso. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the Women's Club for running this. This is the 28th year, which is pretty great. Um, I ran for the planning board five years ago and did not make it, but I want to thank the members of the Board of Selectmen and the planning board that uh, selected me to fill a seat last year. And I want to thank the Democrat Town Committee in Dick Dugan for uh, nominating me again uh, this year and uh, thank the, uh, Ken Wisemantle, Chairman of the Planning Board, for his excellent leadership. and. Um, I'm just glad to be here. I also want to thank uh, my, I guess, running mate, Ron, uh, Pat Mahan, for, uh, for running for the planning board, and it'll be a good addition uh, to the board as well. Thank you. Jean Birchman, the school committee. Thank you. I'd like to say first thank you to the Women's Club and to HCAM for the opportunity to be here tonight, and especially to Nancy Clark uh, for her years of facilitation of this important program. And thank you also to Mr. Graziano and Mr. Carp and the many other volunteers who joined me on the panel tonight and are willing to give of their time and talents for the betterment of the town. Our family places a strong value on community service, and consequently, I've held a wide variety of volunteer positions across the town. I've committed thousands of hours of time to volunteering in the schools for the last 18 years, and I'm committed to continuing that same level of engagement. As a result of my years of direct experience in our schools, I've built excellent working relationships within the district and across the town. 
I've gained an extensive understanding of the operations of our district top to bottom, and I fully understand the impacts and consequences of the choices that the school committee is tasked with making. I've worked consistently to improve the level of community participation and engagement in the work of the school committee. I've built budgets, executed capital projects, led the charge on two strategic plans and worked collaboratively with other town leaders. I continue to work diligently to understand the priorities and goals of the community for the solution to the constraints of the center school and have served as a resource for the work of the ESBC. Hawkington is recognized locally and nationally as an innovative district at the leading edge of education. We have hired a strong educational leader in Dr. McLeod and I look forward to continuing to supporting her growth and challenging her as she leads us onward and upward. Hawkington is on the precipice of another period of rapid growth. It's critical that we work together as a community to plan for and manage that growth carefully. I have the experience, institutional knowledge, proven leadership and dedication necessary to continue to move the district forward. My priority continues to be to provide a high quality education to all of our students at demonstrable value to the taxpayers and I would welcome your questions and be proud to earn your vote on May 18th. Thank you. And John Graziano, the school committee. Thank you, Nancy. Um, good evening. I'd like to thank Nancy and the Hopkinton Women's Club for um, hosting this event, and I'd also like to thank HCAM for broadcasting this event to the citizens who could not be here tonight. My name is John Graziano, and I'm running for re-election to the school committee for a second term. My wife Erin and I have lived in Hopkinton for almost five years. We have three children, two who are currently in the school system, and one about to start next fall. Since moving to Hopkinton, I've been an active volunteer in the community. Whether as a coach on the soccer field, um, in the classroom helping a teacher, or as a committee member on the appropriations committee or school committee, being an active volunteer has always been an important part of living in Hopkinton for me. I believe that it's my way of giving back to the community for the opportunities that it affords my family and I. I'm proud of the accomplishments that the school committee has made since I joined three years ago. The hiring of Dr. Kathy McLeod has stabilized the leadership of the district, and together we've developed a strategic vision for our schools. We've also identified key curriculum and programming enhancements that are delivering a direct impact to the classroom and improving individual student progress. As an active member of the Elementary School Building Committee, we have made tremendous progress towards a solution to the constraints of center school that can be supported by the town and I have enjoyed being an integral part of that process. I believe that I have shown through my work on the school committee that I have an ability to analyze problems, identify solutions that provide the best value for our tax dollars, and build consensus within the community around these solutions. While we have accomplished much over the last three years, maintaining the high standards we have for education in Hopkinton is not an easy task. I look forward to the opportunity to serve to continue to serve on the school committee and I respectfully ask for your vote on May 18th. Thank you. And Brian Karp, candidate for the school committee. Thank you very much Nancy for this opportunity. Also thank you to the Hopkinton Women's Club. I would also like to thank Ms. Birchman, Mr. Graziano, as well as HCAM for their hospitality. My name is Brian Karp and I'm one of the three candidates running for two open seats on the school committee. My family moved here in 2005 Shortly after that, I became very involved in the community. We have two daughters, uh, one about to enter the high school now. Back then, she was about to enter kindergarten. And another daughter in middle school. Shortly after we moved here, I became involved in uh, my daughter's Girl Scout troop. I uh, became a Girl Scout leader. After that, through connections that I made, I got involved with the HPTA and I was the Elmwood Art Room Volunteer Coordinator. After my time as uh, Elmwood Art Room Volunteer Coordinator, I uh, joined the Zoning Advisory Committee, which I served for two years. And after that, I have been on planning board for now for four years. What makes me different from the other two candidates is multifold. On the surface, we may look similar, and we may hold some similar beliefs and ideas. We all support the ES ESBC and urge everyone in town to vote in favor of Article 43 to f allow the funding to, the purchase, to purchase the Irvine property on Hayden Row. We also support fiscal transparency. However, I will push for more fiscal transparency in the budget, 
and support an independent audit of the school department's finances to see how tax dollars can be spent more wisely. I will also ask the questions that need to be asked, such as when we had an override for $1.1 million to replace the Elmwood school roof two and a half years ago, why didn't we go to the MSBCA, MSBA to ask for funding, which would have saved the taxpayers approximately $400,000. I support an open and welcoming communication with the citizens of Hopkinton during school committee meetings as topics come up in the agenda. I bring with me an outside perspective that I will not allow the same business as usual approach to continue with school budgets, committee meetings, and school calendars. I will work with other departments to find you the taxpayer's way to save money. Thank you. And Laura Hansen, candidate for unexpired term on the Parks and Recreation Commission. I'd like to thank the Hopkinton's Women's uh, League, and I'd like to thank each CAM for giving me the opportunity to um, pursue this. <clears throat> I'm running for Parks and Rec because I have been highly involved in the, co uh, the community. Uh, I've lived here for 16 years. And I think it's a great community uh, that supports its residents. and offers high quality programs for uh, both young and old. I think that uh, I would like to be involved uh, with both the public and to make sure that there is transparency and that we respond to uh, what the uh, growing needs of the residents in Hopkinton are. We're a growing town and there's uh, lots of kids and a high demand for high quality programs in the Parks and Rec and there's also uh, a lot of other um, Parks and Rec's issues that um, you know encompass the town and uh, are very important to the vision of our town as a cohesive community and one that operates um, really well and is responsive to its uh, uh, inhabitants. Um, I'm looking for uh, input from the public and um, I want what's best for our kids. I've been involved with scouts and lots of parks and rec programs for many years. I believe in good volunteer uh, opportunities in town and I look forward to uh, working to better the community in um, any way I can. Thank you. And Robert McGuire, candidate for the unexpired seat on the Parks and Recreation Commission. Thank you. Um, I as well would like to th thank, <clears throat> excuse me, HCAM for tonight, the Hopkinton Women's Club, and you too, Nancy, uh, for being the moderator. Thank you very much. And I also want to wish my opponent, Laura Hansen, uh, luck in the election on, uh, on May 18th. Uh, again, my name is Bob McGuire. I'm running for the commissioner's uh, seat in Parks and Rec little history or background on, on myself. My wife Valerie and I have lived in town now for, since 2000. We're raising four children, uh, all four are now teenagers, which is, which is challenging. And my first uh, basically introduction to Parks and Rec was at an early age when they've participated in youth soccer, lacrosse, uh, basketball, baseball. Uh, along the way, I assisted where I could with respect to coaching. I was an assistant coach in the Little League. I was an uh, assistant coach in the youth soccer at one point. I uh, did a bunch of coaching in the rec basketball. I uh, graduated to become a head coach in rec basketball and, uh, and most recently uh, was an assistant coach uh, on one of the travel basketball teams. Uh, I also have served in town and volunteered on other uh, committees. Uh, zoning advisory, ZAC as it's commonly known as. I think I served about three or four years on ZAC, uh, Hopkinton 2020, which is a visionary economic group. I've served in that for a couple of years and I'm still a member of the Hopkinton Chamber of Commerce and served as president for, for a two year term. Um, when, uh, as you probably know, I was appointed back in November, so I've been on the Parks and Rec for about six months now and uh, the first order of business was to hire a director. We've had, unfortunately, some turmoil there, but uh, we've been able to secure that with Jay Gulfie, which has really um, solidified the uh, Parks and Rec uh, program. He's got a great staff with Colleen Allen and, um, and, uh, and Kevin Nathan. 
Um, uh, some of the uh, SRJ today actually, and what, what our goal is to, to uh, find, find other programs such as uh, there might be a new wrestling program as well as flag football. Uh, I, if I have one motto I'd like to see to improve our fields and to also find more fields for the kids to play on. Thank you. And Robert Davinsky, a candidate for a full seat on the Parks and Recreation Commission. Thanks again, Nancy. And I'd like to thank the uh, Hopkinton's Women's Club and H Camp. <clears throat> uh, my wife, Gail, and I, we've lived in town for almost 30 years. We're the proud parents of five children and experienced many of the benefits of Hopkinton School and Park and Rec programs. Uh, I've been very proud to serve for six years, and this will be my third term on the commission. And I'm very proud of this uh, commission that, uh, that I've always served on. Uh, some of our accomplishments, just so the, uh, the audience knows, has been the uh, restoration of the common in the past six years, a very cooperative relationship with Hopkinton Schools, which has led to the uh, use of the residents uh, for the weight room, the, uh, the ice rink, which was a big hit this year, uh, again, a, a terrific cooperative. Uh, initiative along with uh, a growing high school rec basketball program on Sunday mornings. Gets all those young kids out of bed, gets them out on the courts. Some of the other uh, accomplishments have been uh, Hopkinton Youth Football. Girls Lacrosse has kind of fallen under some of our guidance as well as Babe Ruth. Uh, many of you are aware of the Sandy Beach Project, which has now completed its second phase, welcoming the third phase. And I'd like to introduce to you an article that'll be on the uh, ballot Monday, which is the expansion of a structure on Fruit Street. Uh, I know I'm going to be short on time, but this was the original plan for Fruit Street. And many of you have seen that the baseball fields aren't necessarily there, but soccer fields are. So we've enjoyed that property for five years, and there's a safety issue where if inclement weather comes in, there's really not a structure for the kids to go under. Uh, right now it's an open field, and that's a problem if there's thunderstorms. So we've petitioned CPC funding for a structure in this particular area to be a pavilion. It would accommodate uh, the structure, as I mentioned. It would accommodate bathrooms so we can get rid of the outhouses and those ugly storage units. This would be the first phase of a two-phase project that would include restrooms, concessions, storage, and then potentially a multi-use room where we'll be petitioning in the future capital funds for construction. I'd be happy to answer questions at the closing remarks. Thank you. Okay. Let's give a round of applause for all the candidates. <laughs> it is now time for the second portion of our program, the question and answer segment. This is the public's opportunity to ask questions of the candidates. For members of the studio audience who desire to ask a question, please step up to the microphone, state your name, address, and ask your question. If you prefer to submit a written question to me, note cards are available on the back table off on my right. Um, in addition, viewers at home can ask questions by dialing the direct call line that you see on your screen or by sending an email to live at hcam.tv. Please remember that if new people are waiting to ask a question or if I'm receiving new questions, I will enforce a limit of one question per person. If there's silences and nobody's waiting to ask a question, feel free to ask a second question. Responses from candidates must be kept to a maximum of two minutes. If a question is posed to a specific candidate, I will offer response time to all other candidates running for that office. And lastly, the privilege of being the first person to answer in a group will begin alphabetically, and then we will rotate as subsequent questions are asked, alphabetically by last name. And now I invite anyone with a question to come to the microphone, state your name and address, and ask your question, and I see there's someone waiting. Thank you. Hi, my name is Muriel Kramer, 39 North Street. Um, I have a three-part question, so you have to listen, and it's for all the candidates. Um, I'd like to know what you think your priority issue is for the committee or board that you're running for. I'd like to know what you think the priority issue is for the town, 
and I'd like to know how you feel you can impact those issues. All right, so if I can, it's a three-part question, if I can just review it for them, what the priority issue is for your committee, yep. for the town, yep. and how you can impact yes. in that area. All right, and thank you for asking a question that includes everyone. So we'll go in this order. Uh, Darlene Hayes, Library Board of Library Trustees. So do you want to prompt me on each part? Uh, my role in so, uh, is basically what? to support the efforts moving forward for a new library, for the expansion, and for bringing us to where we need to be for the entire community. So you feel that that's the priority issue for yes, the committee? Yes, and support the efforts that are already there. All right, and how that is a priority for the town? Mm -hmm. How that is a priority for I think that makes us in an area where we're going to have expanded services for basically from cradle to grave. You know, a community resource center, or a youth room, an adult room, things like that, places for people to have meetings. I think that we've come to a time where we actually need those expanded services. All right, and the third part was what your role will be in that or how you can contribute? I mean, I think my main role may be um, a lot is going to be support and what their efforts are. The other may be in a role that's more my ballywick in helping with, you know, fundraising and maybe some events. All right, All right great. Thank, thank you. you. And Frank Durso for the planning board. Thank you. Interesting question. I, I hope I can stay under two minutes. Uh, quickly, though, uh, I think the main... Uh, issues facing the planning board is, is to maintain the proper uh, level of uh, smart growth. Uh, we want to maintain the integrity of the town and, and, and the, the vision that we have of the town as being a, a semi-rural, uh, nice place to live. Uh, but we also need to increase our commercial tax base. And um, the second part of the question is, uh, um, how that is a priority for the town, or uh, how that should it all, be a priority it all for the town? folds together as far as the planning board, because we, we, we want to exhibit some leadership on these issues, but also in many ways we're reactive to the uh, desires of uh, citizens and developers as projects come up. Some of the challenges we've been facing are uh, working with, collaboratively with the rest of the town, uh, dealing with uh, legacy farms. And uh, we recently had the crossroads uh, issue uh, we were talking about, and uh, wow. many smaller issues that all add up to a lot of growth. And uh, we have one minute left. Uh, what I could do, uh, continuing as a member of the planning board, is to um, continue working um, w collaboratively with other departments in town, with other um, committees. Um, we have things that we can do that we have expertise in uh, as far as the dealing with the developers and building, but also we have um, other committees like the Green Committee that are involved with um, sustainability and uh, the Board of Selectmen who have the overall leadership of the town. And I'm running out of time, but I hope I've answered the most of your question. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Jean Birchman for the school committee. Yeah, that is a great question. Thank you, Ariel. Um, I think my answer to the first two parts of your question is really one word and it's growth um, and it and it means different things for the school committee um, for the town a little bit but not really uh, so so the growth of the town I think I think we're about to enter a, a new another period of really rapidly expanding growth and we've experienced that um, already when I moved into town that the, the dynamic dynamics and the success of the school district has changed dramatically in the 23 years that I've lived here and that is because of our staff and a concerted effort by the town and the school leadership to really um, improve the quality of our educational system and I think that we are at that juncture again clearly the solution to the center school is a priority issue for the school committee um, I think that as much as the center school location is a sentimental favorite for all of us the ESPC has done exhaustive work and really come to what I think is the right conclusion that that I think Mike um, Shepard said it very nicely that that building has has served the town very well and given us more than we could have asked for and the right solution is to move um, down the road to the Irvine property so how can I so and the same thing really goes for the town with the growth I think that we need to work together with the Board of Selectmen the Planning Board the Appropriations Committee with all of those boards to manage the growth that we can clearly see is coming our way and a lot about that brings 
opportunity. Um, there certainly is an influx of money right now that we didn't see in my early years on the school committee, and so it's <coughs> nice to see all of the town boards have a little bit of opportunity to build back some of the cuts that we all had to make um, when times were a little tighter. So how can I impact these issues? Um, I really feel like the length and breadth of my experience both on the school committee but also directly working in the schools and across the town in many other committees gives me a really solid working knowledge of how all of the components work together. And I'm out of time, uh, so thank you very much. And John Graziano for the school committee. Thank you, thank you, Mira, for the question. Um, I think the priority issue for the school committee is somewhat related to what Mrs. Birchman just said in, with, with respect to growth, and I think it, the priority issue for our committee is the elementary school building project. Um, we have been moving along, at a, I think, at a, a very rapid pace with the school building project, um, keeping the town informed throughout the process, um, and I believe that will continue to be the priority project for our committee. Um, why is it a priority issue for the town? Uh, we are grow not only are we growing rapidly, and we need a school that's going to be able to accommodate some of that growth, but we also know that the center school is no longer optimal to deliver the educational model that we need for our youngest learners. And unfortunately, the site does not provide us with the opportunity to make the changes within that site to, to improve that program. Um, so I believe it's a priority issue for the town for those reasons. How I can impact that project, I currently serve as the school committee representative on the elementary school building committee. I've been a part of this project from the beginning. Um, I've enjoyed forming working relationships with the Mass School Building Authority representatives as well as the owner's project manager and architect that we hired. I've greatly enjoyed being part of the process of working with the community through our forums, through other outreach efforts, and really keeping the community informed throughout the process. And that's something that I'd really like to continue with in this role because I believe that the solution that we're driving towards is the right solution to solve the challenges presented by Center School. And I believe that the process that the Elementary School Building Committee and in conjunction with the Board of Selectmen and School Committee has been going through will help the town be able to agree to the right solution. Thank you. Brian Karp for the School Committee. Thank you, Muriel. It's a great question. Uh, like the other candidates, I do agree that the priority issue is growth. Um, as a committee, I think we're moving in the right direction uh, by trying to get the new school on the uh, Irvine property. The, ESP, the SBC has done a fantastic job so far. Um, for the town, it's the right thing to do. Uh, because of the growth that's happening, uh, in the town, center school is, is no, isn't going to be uh, large enough to support all of the students, especially with the full day kindergarten program. It's not going to be large enough to support uh, all, the, all the incoming students, and we need a larger site. So that uh, becomes a priority for the town to find a better space for our youngest students. How can I impact this issue? I can impact this issue with my experience on the planning board and also the zoning advisory committee. Uh, over the past four years on planning board, I've, um, I've seen all the things that need to go into planning for a site. I've seen the impact um, of the traffic implications. I've seen everything that needs to be gone over when developing um, the site and the building and the site plans. So uh, with, my, with my experience on planning, I think that I can make that impact. Thank you. And Laura Hansen, candidate for the unexpired term on the Parks and Recreation Commission. Thanks, Muriel. Great question. Um, as far as Parks and Rec go, I think the priority is to continue to offer quality programs to all the citizens of Hopkinton and to make sure that you know those pro programs run smoothly. Um, they also have an impact on all the sports and uh, many aspects of uh, Hopkinton life. So I think um, having somebody who is involved with the community, um, my priority would be getting uh, input from the community as to what their needs and what their wants are for these programs. Um, in terms of the town, um, I think 
that the Parks and Rec uh, Department is a wonderful uh, uniting um, facility for our town in terms of getting all kids involved in many different programs and offering opportunities to adults and the community in general. And um, uh, I think that I am uh, would give my all and uh, put excellent effort into being responsive to people and to the needs of the community and listening and responding to that and um, making sure that um, the, the, the needs are met and that those quality programs and that vision actually uh, comes through. Thank you. And Robert McGuire, candidate for the unexpired seat on the Parks and Recreation Commission. Thank you. Thanks, Miro, for the question. My, uh, my priority is, is sort of twofold, really, or two-pronged. Uh, I'd like to see us keep driving program expansion uh, because it, it, the broader we make it, the better. Uh, and that's really the priority of the town. They really want a, a better experience and, and to keep working to make it a better experience for the townspeople. How will I impact that? Uh, I think you need to go outside of the town to look at the way other towns are doing uh, Parks and Rec and what programs they might be offering that seem to be uh, working and try to introduce those ideas here in town. Thank you. And Robert Dubinsky, candidate for the full seat on the Similar. Parks and Recreation Commission. Thank you. Similar to the, uh, the other two candidates, uh, enhancing our programs is something that we've strived for for years. There's not a group in town that we wouldn't entertain, whether it's cricket or the skate park or any sports group and I think the town benefits from the cooperation that we've been able to have with DPW and again I'll reiterate the schools and specifically the sports groups the partnership that we formed with soccer um, on Fruit Street was very instrumental to the two turf fields there and we look forward to doing that with with other groups, whether it be the 26.2 Foundation, whether it be Little League, whether it be Hopkinton Football, I think that's something the town really benefits from is that cooperative uh, aspect. Back to priorities, I think we've been bestowed the custodianship of many of the town's assets and it's our job to keep them up to snuff. Uh, and we need to do that with reducing, if possible, user fees so we can have more people participate. And I think participation is the key. Um, impact, um, I mentioned earlier, Gail and I have five children. They range from 28 to 18, excuse me, 17, not yet. And <laughs> that experience in town working with the different groups and a lot of people that really care about what's happening in the community is uh, something that I can lend to the position, and especially our new effort up on Fruit Street for the pavilion. Thank you. Okay. And there's another question. If you'll just state your name, address, and your question, please. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Dietz and 44 Alexander Road. Um, this question is directed to candidates for the school committee. Um, MCAS scores um, in Hopkinton have peaked and in recent have been trending down ever so slightly. Um, I just wonder if the candidates for school committee have any ideas why this may be happening and if it can be, um, you know, corrected or reversed. Thank you. And actually, John Graziano will be the first one to answer this, and then Brian, and then Jean, you may all come up to the microphone. We all come, come up in order. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your question. Um, it, it's true, we've, we've seen the same data. Um, we have seen some uh, reduction in MCAS scores over time. Um, and that has been one of the focus areas for our um, the recent budgets since we've been since I've been on the school committee um, we've spent a lot of time in partnership with Dr. McLeod and our educational leaders to understand what are the drivers behind the reduction in MCAS scores um, and we've targeted our programs specifically at um, the areas where we think we can have the most impact on bringing those scores up those scores are only one measure of student growth and progress but they are certainly a measure and they they do provide us valuable data um, I think, it, for example, there were two key um, initiatives last year, the Full Day Kindergarten <coughs> Initiative and the Co-Teaching Initiative, that were designed to really work towards um, building up the foundation in the elementary educational areas um, to make sure that we could I increase student progress, get students up to the um, increasing standards that those MCAS, um, that those MCAS tests are measuring. Um, We've seen great progress already in year one from those two initiatives, and we believe that initiatives such as those 
um, will have a direct impact on our MCAS scores and, and bring those scores up in the future because we are building that foundation of learning and getting students further ahead at earlier grades before they start um, taking those MCAS tests. And Brian Carr. Thank you very much again for that question. Um, I would say uh, I agree the MCAS scores, it is, it is clear MCAS scores have gone down. Um, I think that the school committee has done a decent job of setting a strategic plan and initiating uh, different programs such as the co-teaching that John had mentioned. Um, I think that it does take, a, it will take a little bit more time to see the results uh, of, of what's going on uh, to see the MCAS scores increase. Um, thank you. All right, Jean Birchman. Thank you. Um, that is an excellent question. That is a frequent topic of conversation at the school committee and definitely um, a focus of our work. So first of all, I want to take the opportunity to say that Dr. McLeod made an excellent presentation to the school committee at our last meeting on April 16th, which you can watch on HCAM, and I encourage you to do so, where she talks about the performance across the district and specifically about the MCAS scores. So I think it's important to remember that there there are subgroups that are having challenges and we're working diligently to address those challenges and as John mentioned that is the focus of a lot of what you see in our strategic plan particularly as he referenced the full day K initiative the co-teaching initiative are designed to identify those needs and address those needs much earlier and in a more comprehensive way so um, what can we do about it? We can continue the work of the strategic plan, but I want to say that the first thing that I think that we did about it was hire Kathy McLeod. That is one of the feature, one of the focuses of our interview questions. That's what impressed us about Dr. McLeod. She's laser focused on early education, on intervention, on RTI, and she has the skills that we need to get us to where we want all of our students to be. And she understands how to evaluate data and use that data not just to look at on paper, but to inform changes in instruction that are individual to each student and addresses the needs of that particular student and not just a global approach that we hope will stick to for some. So um, I think that we are working very hard. It's not something that changes overnight. I think in particular the slide that I enjoyed the most, the two slides that I enjoyed the most in her presentation, was where she showed us the difference in growth between an entering kindergartner in the fall and a, a, not an essay, a, a exercise that that student was able to to um, to write already and the tremendous growth that has happened already so we're seeing early returns and I encourage you to continue to watch that thank you okay I understand we have a caller on the line can you hear me okay if you would state your name and address and then ask your question please my name is Bob Hebden and I'm we live at 24 Ash Street in Hopkinton question what is your question my question is for the planning board and my question is this I'm curious as how the planning board can support the changes of legacy farms uh, with going from the commercial um, proposal that they had originally proposed to us to adding uh, many individual homes when they have fallen short on their promises of putting in the road from 135 to 85 to eliminate the nightmare every afternoon and evening on 135 and 85. And second of all, we cannot water our lawns every summer. Uh, where are we going to get the resources such as a water supply uh, to take care of all of our residents rather than legacy farms. All right, thank you. Hi, uh, it's a little bit unfair. I think we should really be talking to the uh, school committee uh, and candidates and the park and rec candidates, but quickly I'll say, uh, I hear you're concerned um, about legacy farms. Uh, that road, the bypass road is underway. It is being built. There's been a state grant. 
And uh, I know Mr. McDowell has his guys hard at work on that, and Ken can spot me on this if I'm not exactly correct on these things. Um, I'm the only planning board member opposed to making the change to the current plan for Legacy Farm North. I want to keep the commercial property. I think that's pretty well known. Uh, I share your concern. Uh, so come and talk about it at town meeting. Uh, I'm not sure I, I didn't catch the uh, caller's name. Uh, lastly, about water. Water is a regional issue. It affects us all. And the point is, uh, from the caller I'm getting, is that, yes, we, we have to be more aware of our water management. Um, more construction, more building means we have to be more careful than ever uh, uh, dealing with our water issues. Um, it is a concern, and we are on top of it, and we are looking at things, and uh, I think we're doing a pretty good job of, of managing that. So um, uh, I'm glad to take your questions offline. If, if, if you have any further questions, call her. Thank you for calling. All right, thank you. And there's another person up here waiting to ask a question in the audience. Uh, I have a, a question for the uh, school committee if candidates. You just state your name. Oh, sorry, John Catino, um, David Joseph Road. Um, it's the it's the same softball question that uh, that I asked three years ago of the of school committee candidates. Um, Hopton has and continues to have a large exodus of teachers and administrators retiring. Three years ago, I was asked by a group of retirees to request of the school committee candidates a golden ticket. That's uh, it's a perk that's given to many other. Uh, retirees and other and other communities so that teachers and admi administrators can come back to any football game play musical or something so that they can see the students again at the time both the candidates are now up for, for re-election thought it a no-brainer easy to enact and they were going to get it all done I'm wondering what each candidate will do to make this no-brainer actually happen in the next three years the school committee can come up and Brian Carp will go first. <clears throat> Thank you very much, John, for that question. Um, it does seem like a no-brainer question, and I think it's quite simple. We should allow the retiring teachers to come back and see our their, their former students uh, in the plays, in the sporting events, in, in the other concerts whatever it is that they uh, do want to come and see them and see how they've progressed. Absolutely. Um, why it hasn't been done, I don't know. But I can tell you, if elected to school committee, I will make sure that that does get done. Um, other things that I would like to see done on school committee would be to engage the public in more open conversation during school committee meetings. I'd like to see a lot of things change about the way things are, the way the school, school committee is holding its business. Um, thank you. Um, I think I, I know I had the pleasure of answering this question three years ago, so thank you, but I am going to politely correct a couple of things that you said. Um, in fairness to John, he wasn't on the school committee at that time, he was just running. So I am the only person who was on the school committee at the time, and you're right, I did, I actually think that that's a lovely idea. Um, and I did bring it up at the time to the school committee and there wasn't support actually by the rest of the school committee. So it wasn't that there was a promise and we haven't enacted it. Having said that, absolutely, I think it's um, worth having another conversation. I can't promise you that we're going to take advantage of that because I can't speak for the other four people on the school committee, but I absolutely would encourage you to come and request it at public comment or certainly we can bring it forward. I'm pretty sure Dr. McLeod is in the audience and she just heard you mention it. So um, I absolutely think it's worth discussing Again, I think it's a very nice thank you to our teachers who we know work tremendously hard and are responsible for our student success. So, great suggestion. And John Graziano. So, thank you, John. I do recall the question from three years ago. Um, I, I appreciate it, and I'm quite sure that I spoke out in favor of it. Um, in terms of why it hasn't gotten done, um, as Jean said, I think it was brought up before I was actually uh, elected, not making the excuse for that. The excuse would be that some other stuff happened. Um, it, that, but um, I think it's a great idea. I know one of the things I really enjoy about Kenyon Runner Day at the Elmwood School is seeing Mrs. Silver come back mm -hmm. um, and getting to reconnect with her. Um, so I think it's a wonderful idea. Um, I support it, and what will I do if reelected to make it happen um, is, again, speak to, to Dr. McLeod, um, make sure that there are no, it's no angles that we're not thinking of in terms of, of what the impact would be. Um, but I think it's a wonderful idea, and I think it's something that we should move forward with as quickly as possible. 
So, and I encourage you to hold me to it if I'm reelected, as I know you will. <laughs> and there's another person up at the microphone. Please state your name, address, and your question. Ken Weissman, 145 Ash Street, school committee people to stay up here. Uh, <laughs> the, now, my question uh, resol uh, involves the replacement for the center school. Uh, as been stated earlier today, the uh, elementary school building committee is moving along at a very rapid pace. And, you know, we've side done a site selection and next week at town meeting, the uh, town meeting voters will probably ratify and at town election ratify that site selection. However, my question involves selling the major project, selling the need for it. You know, th the last time we tried to replace this building, we had an uh, utter failure and the voters turned it completely down big time. What are each of you going to do differently or proactively this time to go sell it? And do you think that you can sell it between now and a fall town meeting? All right, and Jean Birchman will go yeah. first. Yeah, thank you, Ken. Thank you for that question. And, and again, I'm, I'm the culpable one <laughs> standing up here because I was on the committee at the time that the building project failed. Um, and one of the reasons that I am running again is because I, I started supporting a new elementary school project in this town in 2001 when my youngest daughter was going to be in the first grade when we opened it. She's now a freshman in the high school and it's 2015 and we still are struggling to make this happen. So um, I think a couple of things are different and I think a couple of things are better. I think that this site, which is, is now available to us, offers a lot more flexibility to the town going forward over the next many decades than what the center school site offers because of the constraints of that site. So I think that the site selection is excellent. I think that the design selection firm that we have has done a tremendous job with community engagement, as, as has the ESBC. But um, the forums that they've had have been very successful and garnered a lot of community engagement. We now have the opportunity to push the message out much more easily through social media. I think one of the major challenges that we had the last time was a disconnect of communication and that the school committee was operating on some old uh, uh, clearly feedback about what priorities were for the district and um, since that time we've worked as a committee and Nancy Burdick and I in particular did communication surveys for the committee and developed a communications plan to make sure that we take the time to stop along the process and have those conversations and make sure we're all on the same page so I think all of those improvements are in place and I really am much more optimistic that things will go forward this time and, and much more hopeful because the need has not gone away the, the building really is constraining our ability to, to educate those kids and I know that I think there's a lot more understanding of that now in the town and and certainly a lot of support so thank you for the question John Graziano thank you Ken for the question um, I, I think that the, the short answer is is two-way communication two-way communication two-way communication and and we've started this process th from the beginning of the elementary school building committee's work um, Mr. Markey, Mr. Shepard, Mr. Nickerson, um, all the members of the committee have been really com committed to making sure that we are not only as an elementary school building committee communicating with the community at every stage to let them know where we are in the process, why decisions have been made, what's the data that supports those decisions, but the forums that we have had which I've, I've been so impressed with the turnout at these forums. Um, in fact, our, our designer and our owner's project manager continue to say how blown away they are by the turnout at these forums. And at those forums, one of the key pieces of it is eliciting real-time feedback, giving people post-it notes to put on the different options to say what they like about it, what they don't like about it, and collating that feedback and making it a data point in our process. We're going to continue that. Uh, it's been a rapid process, or maybe it just feels rapid to me, but it's been a regimented process. And we, we have a continued plan between now and a potential fall town meeting that is not just about what are the steps we need to go through with the Mass School Building Authority, 
but what are the steps we need to go through with the community? What are the unanswered questions for both the Irvine property acquisition article and also the future article on what the solution is? And how do we answer them? How are we making sure that we have the pulse of the community? This is a, a major focus for us and will continue to be. I think the communication efforts that have gone on in this project have been top notch. Um, I had a longtime resident pull me aside at one of the forums and say, if anybody stands up at town meeting and says, you haven't communicated effectively with the community, I'm going to go to the microphone and tell them they're crazy. Because this committee has communicated effectively with the community, and that's, that's the short answer. Well, it's actually kind of a long answer, but that was the short answer to the question. Brian Karp. Ken, thank you very much for the question. Um, I want to start off by saying there are some differences between the last time. Uh, the school committee tried to sell a new school to the town. One of the differences is that site was on the outskirts of town. This site is more centralized, keeping the schools closer together. Last time, uh, the town, uh, the school committee uh, suggested or proposed uh, districting. This time, there's been no such talk of districting. Um, those being the major differences between the two, I, I do want to commend the ESBC. Uh, and the work that they've done with this and for all the public forums that they've held. They've been great as far as keeping an open line of communication with the public. The school committee needs to continue to do that work. The school committee needs to get out and have public forums. They need to get out and listen to the public. They need to be engaged with the townspeople. Not just the people who have children in the school, but people who don't have children in the schools. People whose children are going to be entering the schools, people whose have, who've had children leave the schools because they're all taxpayers and every single one of us is going to have to pay the price for that new school. Um, as a school committee, um, oh, the, one th the, the other thing that I want to um, mention is uh, this site is large enough to put a new school that will house the pre-K through grade one. It's also large enough to house a um, parking area for the school buses. One of the things that uh, that would do is save the town about $110,000 annually. By keeping the buses here in Hopkinton, the town would get the benefit of the excise tax. They would save on the gas from driving from Ashland to Hopkinton. So it's a multifold benefit to the town by having this school here uh, on the Irvine property. Thank you. I've had a question emailed. Actually, I've had a few questions emailed. Um, I'll, I'll take one of them right now, and then if anyone from the studio audience has another question, just go up to the mic so that I know. Uh, this is a question for everyone, and we'll start at the other end this time with Mr. Dubinsky. It's very simple, and it intrigues me. What don't you know yet about your committee, I assume, and how do you plan on learning it? So if the first three people from that end will come up. First, Robert Dubinsky candidate for the Parks and Recreation Commission full-term seat? That's a very interesting question, but I think a lot of times you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> so you need, to, you need to keep your ears open. You need to embrace everybody's opinion. You need to understand maybe why somebody is acting the way they are because it's maybe not the issue that they're, they're embracing you with. Uh, so the short answer is Sometimes you don't know what you don't know, so you listen. Robert McGuire, candidate for the unexpired seat on the Parks and Recreation Commission. It, it's hard not to take Bob's answer uh, and re, you know, say it once again, but I just uh, keeping our ears open and trying to see what we, what we can learn from other people and hopefully uh, implement it along the way. Hansen, candidate for the unexpired term on the Parks and Recreation. Well, being new to this whole uh, <laughs> process, um, what I don't know is a lot. But um, I am extremely receptive, and I'm a fast learner, and I like to listen to everybody's opinions and everybody's input, and I value um, I value very diverse opinions and try to find a common ground throughout those. So I'm looking forward to this learning process, for sure. And Brian Karp, candidate for the school committee. Thank you. Uh, being the outsider in this race, I, I would say I probably know less than my, my opponents. 
Um, what I don't know, I will certainly learn pretty quickly. I've learned a lot in the last few weeks by watching school committee meetings, going through notes, going through meetings, uh, agendas, and minutes, um, by talking to people. And that's what I do. I talk to people, I listen to what they have to say, I read, I study, I'm as informed as I can be before I make any kind of a decision. So that's how I would learn, by, by listening to people, by reading, by going, by watching video, and thank you. Hi, John Quasiano. So um, thank you to whoever emailed in this question. Uh, excuse me, Sorry. I failed to mention that. I was going to do it at the end. Um, it was submitted by Amy Schwartz. OK. So uh, Amy, thank you for this question. Uh, I will tell you, the timing of it's interesting because I've spent much of the last week and a half or so getting ready for town meeting. And so I feel like every day I'm reminded of apparently something new I don't know about being on the committee because it's a constantly moving process. Um, but I think what I don't know about my committee is probably similar to a prior answer about what you don't know what you don't know. I, you don't, we don't know what's next. Um, we have an idea. The strategic plan is designed to guide us through what our initiatives are going to be. But when I stood up here three years ago, the issues that we have faced as a committee in the last three years were not the issues that I expected to face coming into this election. Um, the challenges are sometimes ones that you don't see coming. And the way to, the way to prepare for that is something that I really engage in, and that's interaction with both the community and with other boards and committees in town. I formed great working relationships with town hall, um, with members of, the, of other boards uh, within town, and I also engage in a lot of formal and informal communication with community members. Um, we may only have the two public comment sections at school committee meetings, but what's not seen is the, the number of emails we get, the number of phone calls we get with people asking questions or raising issues, um, the number of issues that come through the school administration um, that we need to deal with and we need to study and learn and identify what the best solutions are. Um, so for me, it's a constant learning process and it's, it's a continuous improvement process as a school committee member to to stay informed and stay prepared for the challenges that lie ahead because I'm quite sure that what I'll face on the next three years, if I'm fortunate enough to be reelected, is not what I'm expecting now. Okay. And Jean Birchman? That is a really good question. I think, um, I think Ken already fed us a little bit of what do we not know. Uh, how is the community going to react to the next building proposal? Um, I think as even though I've, I'm sort of the dinosaur currently of the school committee and I have been around a long time, I'm continually surprised, as John said, about all of the new things that I'm learning. I've learned a tremendous amount, particularly from our administrators. Um, I think some things that we don't know is what is the Department of Education going to come up with next year or the year after or the year after that? What are the new needs of our students? What are the changing um, instructional techniques? educational technologies, all of those kinds of things that we will be asked to weigh in on. So how do I find those things out? Um, first of all, I listen to the professional educators that we've hired to do those jobs and to give us those recommendations. But what I have always done and what I will continue to do is just be actively engaged in this community. I do not make it to every single school event, but I go to the vast majority. I don't make it to every town event, but I go to a lot of them. I try to be out and just talk to people and understand what their current concerns are, goals are, hopes are, um, and I think that that's helpful. In addition, I do a lot of work with other departments in town, and it's given me an opportunity to just make some connections between committees and people that um, that I think have been helpful. So. I, you know, I'll continue to do that. I think in addition, we've worked hard to create policies on the school committee. I know that public comment is limiting and frustrating for people, but we have additionally a communications policy where we talk about whenever there's a need for a community forum, we like to invite people in to share what their uh, concerns are, their goals are about new programs. Dr. McLeod has, has utilized those quite effectively. So there are a lot of things like that. But uh, the short answer is ask people what they want and what they need and listen to what they have to say. And Frank Durso for the Planning Board. Yes, as one of the newer members of the Planning Board, there, there's much I, I do not know, but I think I have somewhat of a advantage of having been on the Conservation Commission for four years previous. Um, the motto of the president of my uh, college that I went to for my master's degree was, 
Uh, no one knows what we all know. And that means that together we are better and stronger and smarter. And um, hopefully that my, my colleagues on the planning board uh, think that we're a stronger planning board with me on it. Darlene Hayes, the Board of Library Trustees. So I think it goes, for me, it starts off that, you know, I'm a user and supporter of the library to, you know, building a more formal role, role is that my first steps where I actually called the executive director and spoke with Ronek, got information and data, and found out what was important to them. Met with, you know, Barbara Beale from the Friends of the Library and found out what was important to them and asked the questions to know what their platforms are, what their priorities are, so that, you know, I know really what I'm going in formally to support and to make the best library we can for our future. Thanks. All right, thank you. And is anyone else in the studio audience have a question? If not, I will let Ken ask a second question. Ken Weissmantle, 145 Ash Street. Uh, this question is for the candidates for Parks and Recreation. Uh, a couple years ago, we in instituted an enterprise fund for the financing of the Parks and Rec program. I understand with all the bond issues and whatever that we're running a deficit in that fund. Do you believe that enterprise fund for Parks and Rec programs uh, is really working? Are you wanting to raise uh, fees uh, or, or participation fees to try to cover a deficit? Or do you think the town taxpayers should subsidize the programs like we probably did many years ago? Okay, if the three of you will step up and going alphabetically, we can begin with Bob Devin Robert Javinsky. Great, uh, <clears throat> great question, Ken. And I think there's a uh, been a little misconception on the town's part for our enterprise fund for I was uh, I was on the board when we switched over um, our subsidy we do receive some subsidy from the town for our programs and our main goal is to operate a, a zero based department over the tenure that I've been on the board we've been able to reduce that year after year and we should also note that we've established a fruit street fund in anticipation of replacing the turf so besides the subsidy we get from the town that fund has approximately the we're working out some financial uh, details with the town but over a hundred thousand dollars that parks and rec will contribute along with soccer's contribution to have those fields replaced in eight years again I'll go back to that's why this the, this group and this commission wants to make the investment in the pavilion up on the property because we see it as an ongoing uh, resource for the town uh, just this year, the Fruit Street property generated some $60,000 of additional revenue from groups outside of Hopkinton after we served the groups in Hopkinton, whether it be the sports groups, whether it be the school that needed places to, to practice given the, given the poor spring we had. To answer your question directly, is it a reality that our department runs a zero base on the, on the shoulders of our participants? Maybe not, but I think our efforts in reducing that contribution year after year has been outstanding. All right, and Laura Hansen, again, concerning the enterprise fund and the deficit, and do you think that fees should be raised or Well, unfortunately, I um, am not completely up to uh, quota on the enterprise fund. Um, but in general terms, I think that when the community wants high quality programs, they will be willing to pay for those. I also believe that the town can uh, subsidize a certain amount of that too, especially if revenue is generated by out, um, you know, out of town teams coming in to take advantage of our excellent fields, um, having that resource and having our town be a welcoming place for other teams and other towns, I think that will generate a certain amount of revenue. I think that there's a way that we can make it so not only the contributions of the town members for these excellent activities that the Parks and Rec provide, uh, plus the revenue that we get from the, um, the, the teams and the sports uh, that we offer you know, well, hopefully we can find some middle ground on that. So hopefully I will be learning more. <laughs> and Robert McGuire. 
So being a six-month newbie, I'm still trying to get my hands around the enterprise fund. But I, what I, what I can say that Jay Golfie is diving into uh, the enterprise fund and working on budgets to find out where we're, you know, some programs that uh, are being uh, supplemented and, and some and others that aren't. Uh, I don't want to see funds. Uh, excuse me. Um, I don't want to see the town pick up, uh, incur more costs. And the goal is to get to uh, right, right to zero and have enough money to pay for all the. Uh, the programs we offer and continue to find outside ways to rent the fields, similar to what Bob said with some of the soccer programs that use the fields in early, early uh, March. All right, thank you. I have another question that was emailed in, and at, at this point I also want to encourage uh, viewers at home, if you'd like to call in, uh, please do so using the number on the screen. Uh, this question is for the school committee, and um, it is Jean's turn to go first. Uh, it is from Rebecca Roback, and the question is, Hopkinton has been recognized for having an excellent school district. As a school committee member, what is working well in the schools that you want to make sure to continue? And if you had to sacrifice another program to keep your favorite program, what would it be? So what is working well that you want to continue, and if you had to sacrifice a program to keep your favorite program, what it would be? So the three school committee candidates can come up, and it will begin with Jean. First. Okay. Um, this is a hard question. It's like choosing between your children. <laughs> and I, I, uh, I hope that if the Appropriations Committee is listening, I hope that they hear what I'm about to say, which is that I would never have voted for anything in a budget that I didn't think we absolutely needed. Um, having said that, I also have experienced budget cycles where we couldn't afford what we thought we absolutely needed and we had to make some really difficult choices. Um, in recent years, we've had a little bit of an opportunity to repair some of that damage, but that's never a guarantee. So I'll just make a general statement that that's why I think planning just sustainable and manageable budgets going forward is so critical, ju not just for the towns, but for the schools as well. Backwards, not just for the schools, but for the town as well. So what's working well and what would I like to continue? I think, um, you know, we're, the the work that we've done most recently with the community on the strategic plan and around um, identifying needs earlier and tailoring education to the individual learners, I think, is really at the forefront of we, what we need to do. What would I sacrifice for that? Um, I think that the goal and the early indications are that those programs, once they have had a period of time to um, to start to create a return on an investment actually will save us some money. In the short term, um, I think the, the, the program that leaps out to me when, that, when I hear that question is that we've really struggled, struggled over the implementation um, and expansion of foreign language in this district. And it was in our last strategic plan, it's in our current strategic plan. I have wanted for six years to implement that because of budget constraints and whatever else we haven't been able to. And unfortunately, I think at this point, we still aren't ready to. So that's something that I think we need to take um, a deeper look at. And I, you know, I, I think that's, that's where I'll end. <laughs> thank you. John Graziano. Um, thank you, Rebecca, for the question. Um, I, I agree. We, it's wonderful to be recognized as having an, an excellent district. And it's a constant challenge for us to make sure that we can continue to meet and perform at that level. Um, what's working well I think especially in the last year or so is that um, under the leadership of, of Dr. McLeod, um, the school district is really able to access and analyze data on the effectiveness of programs and the effectiveness of our instructional model and communicate with the community about that effectiveness in ways that we haven't before. Um, I think that we're able to draw conclusions that allow us to back up our, our budget asks um, for these programs. And sort of moving, so in terms of what would I sacrifice, um, I don't have a, a specific answer of a program. It's a really tough question to answer um, at this moment, but what I would say is the data analysis that, that we're able to access um, now that Dr. McLeod is, is providing to us um, to make some of these decisions, I think allow us to look, look really hard at what programs aren't delivering 
the instructional value? What programs are no longer as effective as maybe they once were? And while they may have been sort of a sacred cow in the past in terms of, of the instructional model, the data tells us that they're not being effective so that it's time to look at it differently. Um, so I would say that programs that I would look to cut would be anything that is no longer effectively delivering um, student instruction or, uh, or can be effectively tied to student progress. Right. And Brian Carp. Thank you, Rebecca. Great question. Um, so we have a strategic plan that's in place and is and is that's being been being implemented. I give a lot of kudos to Dr. to Dr. McLeod and her team. Uh, it's going to take some time to see some change, uh, but the but the changes will come. Um, what's working well? A lot of things in the school are working and the schools are working well. Um, one of the things that um, that Ms. Birchman had mentioned is, you know, she talked about a foreign language program that she'd like to see. This is something that the school committee just cut uh, just a few a few weeks ago or months months ago. Um, if we're going to grow as global citizens, which is what our our strategic plan says, then we need to implement a, for a foreign language program to extend past down past the seventh grade. Uh, into the elementary level. Um, things that I would like to see cut, I'd like to see uh, a lot of the busy work that the teachers are giving our students. Some of, the, some of our students um, are accelerated and the teachers don't know what to do with them and they give them busy work to keep them busy. They're not learning, they're not, they're not uh, getting the instruction that they need and I think that's something that needs to be changed, and I'd like to see the busy work cut. Thank you. All right, thank you. There's someone at the microphone again who wants to ask a question of the school committee. Save you the up and down. Mm -hmm. um, Muriel Kramer, 39 North Street. Um, understanding uh, this year in particular, but every year, we're facing as a town an awful lot of budget pressures. We have the elementary school building coming, um, and I totally support that. And, and uh, and I stand prepared to work to see that be a success. So this isn't a question about um, whether these are priorities. I think that they're all priorities. So we have uh, a DPW facility. Um, you know, it would be nice to have a DPW facility. Um, what they have now just can't even be called that, you know. Um, so my question to you as school committee members, um, facing all these budget priorities and understanding that you have the lion's share of the town's budget. What do you see is your responsibility as school committee members, not to protect your priorities, but to balance and protect the priorities of the whole town? All right, and the first responder will be John Graziano. Thank you, Muriel. Um, so I think, I think it's a great question because you're right. Every year we're facing very difficult budget decisions, not just within the school district, but within the town. There are initiatives that I know the Board of Selectmen, the Appropriation Committee have struggled with just as we struggled with some decisions around specific programs. Um, I believe that our responsibility to the town as a school committee is to work collaboratively with other town boards, with town hall, with um, with the, the citizens to lo to look at what are our town-wide priorities. It's true that the school budget represents the, the majority of the overall town budget, um, but some steps that we have taken to increase that collaboration, um, we've actually adjusted our, our budget process this past year. And one of the reasons that we adjusted this the budget process is to allow us to have a better, more thorough communication with the town so that we could understand as we were developing a budget and we were heading towards a percentage, being in communication with the town manager to understand what did the financial picture look like? Were we going to be unknowingly putting additional pressure on the town to have to balance school asks versus town asks? That's not fair to the citizens and, and it's our responsibility as elected officials to make sure that we can bring forward the most responsible overall town budget. I for one actually um, like the fact that at town meeting it's no longer a school budget and a rest of the town budget. It's one town budget and I think what we've worked to do over the past couple of years in is increase collaboration with the town to make sure that 
we could understand the priorities of the town and the financial pressures of the town so that it, we weren't operating our budget in a vacuum and could understand and could deliver the most responsible overall budget to the town and Brian Carr Ariel, thank you for the question you're absolutely right the DPW facility is deplorable it needs it needs to uh, be rectified there's no way that they should be working out of two different stations two different places and it's inefficient and it's not acceptable. Um, as far as budget priorities, in order to try to get more cash so that the town has money to spend other places, I'd like to change the way that the school budget is created. I think the fixed portion of the school budget is way too high. Um, you know, when, when we look at a fixed and a fixed budget that, that is that high, we need to find out why. And we need to uh, rein in um, that fixed budget portion of the school budget so that we have money to spend in other, other parts of the budget for the school committee and also for the town. And Jean Birchman. Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. And I'll start with my favorite word of the night again, growth. Um, I think that, you know, what, what you're referencing, what we're seeing is the impact of, again, a lot of growth. We, there are a lot of needs um, across the town for different departments, not just the school department. Certainly, that's what we are tasked with prioritizing, but it's important to work collabor co collaboratively with all of our partners across the town. Um, I do feel like we could make improvements, and I hope that we will, working with town hall as far as sharing information. We do sometimes feel, because we do our budget process in advance of theirs a bit, that that we're operating in a bit of a vacuum and we don't want to it's not our place to prioritize our needs over the other needs but if we're not aware at the time of what they are it's difficult for us to make an informed decision um, and so I think working together collaboratively to improve that communication um, has is an important goal um, there have been some attempts to do things like that, like the capital asset management program that we've that we've worked on collaboratively. So I think there are steps in the right direction. I just think that there's definitely more work that needs to be done. Um, in my tenure on the school committee, we've actually, although we still have more than the majority of the overall town budget, that our percentage has shrunk in the six years that I've been here from like 58% down to, I don't know, for 53 or 54% this year. So is it a giant difference? No, but we are being very careful. We are looking very closely at budgets. Um, we have tasked Dr. McLeod and our newly hired SPED director with doing what we refer to as a forensic analysis of what are we doing that we don't need to be doing anymore? How can we reallocate the resources that we already have rather than asking for new resources? And we need to continue to do that. And I think, as John mentioned, the data that we continue to have available to us is improving our ability to, to make those things happen. Um, and finally, I just think that we need to look for revenue enhancements like our F1 visa program that's been very successful. And we're coming up on the charter review, so that's a good conversation to have with the town about how are we all working together. So thank you. All right, thank you. I'm going to let the school committee sit down, probably okay. briefly only. But I have a, a few questions, and many of them would be repetitive. but. Um, from high school students, from some groups of students. And one is actually for the Board of Library Trustees. So I thought we'd change the pace a little bit and let the school committee sit down. Um, it Basically, these students, and it was a small group, I do not know their names, but we must admit we do not know much about your committee. What is your major role, and how do you hope to positively affect the committee? Well, actually, I don't know a lot about the committee itself yet either. That's why I'm asking questions and reaching out. Um, I think one of my roles, like I said, will probably be to help with fundraising events and support and supports of whatever their mission is. Um, I think people have, some people have thought that libraries are outdated and obsolete and that they're actually in ever-growing need in communities. Um, I went to a very small, at the time, women's college and was just featured this past week in the Boston Globe for its growth. It's now a co-ed college, not that I'm happy about that part, but it's, um, it's also been recognized as the uh, college in the country that has gone entire iPad. It, it, um, Apple has recognized them left and right, who has now tripled the expansion of their library. That the library growth is still needed, and that I think is people seeing that even though technology is growing, so is the needs for libraries and the community 
that th those create. Thank you. Anybody from the audience? I have another question that I could ask if nobody has one. All right, it is for the school committee. <laughs> and this time, Brian Karp will go first. And the question concerns technology integration. The town has spent a lot of money in recent years to integrate more technology in the classroom. In what ways do you believe that that has enriched the learning experience of students? And what priorities do you have concerning technological integration? So in what ways do you think it's enriched the learning experience and what priorities do you have in that area? And that is from a group of high school students as well. It's a very good question. Um, the technology integration uh, program has, has been great. The one-to-one -one program through the high school, um, it, it, I think, is, is doing really well. It's now, I think, we're in our fourth year. Uh, so now we have a full high school on the one-to-one -one program. Um, it's enriching them because they have a whole lot more access to learning. When we learn, we learn from textbooks. But now, we also in the digital age, we also learn by looking things up, we go to Google, we find out what can we do? How do we do this? How do we learn? We all, we, we, if we don't know something, we, we look to our computers to, go, to uh, help us. One of the priorities that I see, one of the issues that I see with this though is, our students now have all this internet access. Um, and un unmanned and, or unsupervised, it can be very dangerous, especially as we uh, integrate the one-to-one -one program down into uh, younger grades. Um, there needs to be great supervision. We need to make sure that our servers are secure. We need to make sure that our students aren't doing things that they're not supposed to be doing with, with the server, you know, over, over the school's systems and uh, with their computers. And that's the concerns that I have, but I think that it's done a great job in, in helping our students learn. Thank you. Jean Birchman. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, from, from the high school students whose technology skills far outstrip my own. Um, so we were one of the early districts to implement the one to one laptop initiative and it was a challenging road to get there and I think that the program has really gained quite a bit of momentum and made a major difference in um, the learning opportunities that we're providing for our kids at the high school. And uh, our technology director is doing a great job of identifying how we can implement that at the younger grades. But I, I agree with Brian that we need to be careful in addition to, to giving the gadgets to teaching the kids how appropriately to use them. Uh, to be mindful of what their social footprint is and to be careful about guarding their safety. Um, some of the things that I think technology really allows our kids to do that I was not able to do when I was in, in their, when I was their age, uh, it really brings the world, makes the world a smaller place. It expands their opportunity to connect globally with other people. Um, it really supports 21st century learning as far as communication, collaboration skills, creativity. And these are the skills that we are hearing from colleges and from employers that they are looking for from our graduates. And it's our, our responsibility to prepare them to be successful citizens in this world. And the technology skills are critical for that. Um, it doesn't mean you buy every new toy that you find. I think we are very careful to um, to invest in technology that has uh, sustainability, has flexibility, and that is accessible to everybody. The other thing that I think is tremendous is um, what our special education department has been able to do with assistive technology, and that has really made some tremendous um, improvements in the ability of some of our special needs students to, to learn and to tailor in um, instruction to them more individually. So, thank you. And John Graziano. Um, so I would echo Mrs. Birchman's comment that I think technology integration is part of that strategic plan clause about building global citizens. Um, any of us in the workplace, uh, technology is increasing every day. And so if we're not integrating technology into our schools, we're not adequately preparing our students to move out into the world. Um, I think that we've done a lot right as a school district with technology integration. I think the opportunities where it has enriched the learning for students, um, first and foremost, is in differentiation. We're able to, through the use of technology, to actually tailor instruction more to individual student needs. And this is something that we can't, the teachers can't as easily do without some of these, the technology. Um, and, and 
flowing off of that is, is enrichment, and that's part of that differentiation. Um, I know that I see my children come home and have access to online resources that not only are helping with the skills, enrich the skills that they're developing um, through the curriculum, but they're also measuring their progress. So the teachers can understand by looking at those online enrichment resources, is a student rising in their reading level? They may not be at the same reading level as the other children in their grade level, but are they making progress? And technology allows us to not only measure that, but again, differentiate that learning. Um, and then collaboration and ease of doing work. I have a fourth grader who has access, who has, like all other fourth graders, has a Google account through the schools. Um, she can do work collaboratively on group projects with classmates already um, in, term, in terms of sharing versions of presentations that they're making to their class. Um, priorities for me are professional development. I do think the one-to-one -one laptop initiative has been great for the high school. The one thing that we hear um, if there's a development opportunity, it's that teachers want more development around how to effectively utilize that one-to-one -one program in schools. How can they get the most out of it? And so I think our responsibility as, well, the administration's responsibility as well as our responsibility as a school committee is to ensure that the instructors have the tools to get the most out of that technology. Thank you. All right, thank you. It's another question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Muriel Kramer, 39 North Street. I'm sorry, I, have, I was spurred on because of that last question. It's a follow-up to this question. Um, so I have six children uh, ranging in age from 28 to 13, almost 14. Um, so I've seen this great shift firsthand, um, and I would agree with you that there have been a lot of advantages. Um, I have recently gone back to graduate school, and an interesting thing happened to me in two of my classes. I've taken four classes. In two of my classes, laptops are not allowed because they are interfering with interaction and education. So philosophically, where is the balance and how do we strike it? And Jean Birchman would go first. Okay. Um, I think that's a great point. And I, I will say I have two children in college. I guess they're adults. Um, in college and you know when we first started talking about the one-to-one -one initiative there was a lot of pressure well they're going to be taking online courses in college and that hasn't been the experience of my kids they absolutely have used technology to a greater degree um, than they did in high school and then certainly we all did in high school but they haven't taken online courses and I, I think I'm very interested to hear that they're sort of a, a lap a lids down that's what they say at the high school right um, course so I think that that really um, that gets to what I was saying before about learning, teaching the kids how to use it for their instruction and for their learning. And so maybe they're not using it in the context of a classroom to be taking notes or however it is that, that they might otherwise do, use it, but as a resource and a tool to them outside to improve their study habits. I think one thing we've done a great job with at the high school is teaching the kids how to organize themselves and organize all of their documents on their laptops so that they have everything that they need. They do learn a lot about working together virtually on projects. Um, so, but I, but I think you're right. It's, I think sometimes just generally in this in our society, when there's a shiny new technological gadget, a lot of people want to go out and use it and chuck what they already have. And I, I don't think that's the right approach. And I don't feel that's the approach that we've taken. I think John raised a good point that we we do put an emphasis increasingly on how are they using this to improve their individual instruction. And I think. At the bottom line, that's the answer. And in some classrooms, it's lids down. And in, in other classrooms, it's we're going to talk to somebody in China today. And so it's good that we have that range of, of options available, I think. John Graciano. So if I could make a correlation to the, the workplace, um, my department has recently banned laptops from our team meetings. And the reason they have is because the laptops aren't enhancing the experience, they're detracting from it. We're multitasking, we're checking email, we're um, you know, dealing with issues that are occurring outside of the meeting, and it's distracting our focus from the topics being driven by the people in the room. And that's an ineffective use of technology. It's a, it's, it's a, again, it's a detraction. Um, so to me, it's about the instructors finding that balance between, is what I'm doing in the classroom with the students enhanced by the use of the device? Is it not enhanced by the use of the device? Would the device detract from it? And I think the more tools, I'm going to come back to that professional development piece, the more tools we can give teachers about how to manage a classroom in a one-to-one -one environment. 
Um, they, they've only been doing this for a few years at most. Um, how can they get the most out of those devices and how can they effectively create the boundaries where the devices or whatever technology they're utilizing are a distraction or a detraction from the instruction that they're delivering. Um, so I, I think that also comes with measuring the effectiveness of, of the use. So are we getting results out of, um, out of this technology? So are we seeing these enrichment programs I talked about? Are we actually seeing students grow along um, their learning curve as a result of them? Um, or are they substituting for something else, some in-person instruction that would be of better value? And Brian Karp. Um, it's a very fine line to balance, that, to balance those two. Um, the technology allows for um, a lot more communication op openly, globally, uh, with other members in your, in your team. In a classroom, if the teacher, if, the, if that's what the teacher uh, is deciding to do, they, you know, we need to be aware that that, that the uh, when the computers are up, that's that that's what they're doing, because when the computers are up, there's not always going to be um, learning, like like was said, you know, people can multitask. Lids down, you know, as as Jean had said, and the the term they used in the high school, allows for that interpersonal interaction. It allows for that one-to-one -one so that you know that the student is engaged because they see what the teacher can see what the student what where the student's eyes are and what they're doing you know when when the computer is open you hope that they're taking notes and they should be taking notes you hope they're doing what they're supposed to be doing you hope that they're learning the way that they should be um, so it is a fine line thank you all right, and if you'll stay up there one more time, I do have one more question that was emailed in. It is for the school committee, and I'd like to ask it. Part of it may be similar to something you've answered already, but I think it has a, a new point. So um, if you would bear with me, and then after this, I think we'll do the, the closing remarks. Um, this question was emailed in by Danielle Owens, and it concerns the elementary school building. And the question is, all three candidates have stated their involvement with the elementary school building committees efforts to solve the problems at Center School. What specifically has each candidate done to support the efforts? And what do they think are the biggest challenges ahead for the project? So what specifically have you done to support the efforts? And if you have anything else to say about the challenges, which I think has been covered a little bit already. And um, John Graziano. Oh, um, so what specifically have I done? Um, I, so I've been a member of the, I've been the school committee representative on the elementary school building committee since it was put together. Um, so I have been involved in, at every step of the process from uh, community engagement to the um, hiring of the owner's project manager and designer to um, the, the data analysis that led to our preferred solution um, that will be, that, that will drive the, the town meeting article next week. Um, so my involvement at this point has been heavy. Um, I, have, I have collaborated directly with the Mass School Building Authority to understand their process, understand how we can stay either in, at pace with or in, if we can, a little bit ahead of their process. I've worked with Dr. McLeod and Mrs. DeBow to understand what is the educational model that they want to deliver in that building? Because building an elementary school isn't just about building a building, it's about building a facility that can most effectively deliver the education that we want for our youngest learners. Um, so, uh, so I, again, I, I've been involved in every step of the way. I've been at almost every elementary school building committee meeting. I've been at all the forums. Um, I've been at most of our meetings at the MSBA. Um, so I, again, my, my involvement has been, has been heavy, um, and I feel as if I've been a, a valuable contributor to this process, and I really look forward to the opportunity to continue to be a valuable contributor. Um, what are the challenges? Communication, as well as I think we've done, is always going to be a challenge. The turnout has been great at the forums, but we know there are going to be more voters than that at town meeting. So how do we ensure that every person is informed, every person has their questions answered in a way that allows them to come to town meeting to support the solution that's going to deliver the best educational model for our younger learners and the best value for the town that we can get out of the school building project? Brian Karp. What specifically have I done? 
I, I will say I have not been as involved as, as John over here. I've not been on the ESPC. Uh, I've not been on the committee. Um, I have spoken with the chairman. Uh, the uh, elementary school building committee did come before planning board and they did do a presentation. We all had, we all weighed in on it. I think that they've done a fantastic job in what they, in, in the way that they've communicated uh, to the public with their open forums, um, with their site. Um, so I congratulate them again on, on everything that they've done. Uh, the challenges, like John said, are communication. And so as a school committee member, if I'm elected, I will make sure that we uh, get that communication out to the public. Anyone who wants to weigh in uh, with their opinions on the, on the new building site, uh, I would welcome them to come to school committee meetings. I would welcome them to uh, email. I would welcome them to uh, get in touch with the school committee and, and let their voice be heard. What I, what I look for is a two-way communication between the school committee and the public. Anyone who's interested, anyone who is going to vote, anyone who wants to vote should be in touch with the school committee. They should voice their opinion because their opinion counts. And Jean Birchman. Thank you. Uh, so what, what specifically have I done to be involved with the ESPC? First, I would say that I was involved um, extensively in the groundwork that led to the forming of this current version of the ESPC. Again, unfortunately, I was on the committee when the former building project did not pass. And the committee um, worked very, very hard to listen to the community. We did surveys. We had forums. Um, we created a roadmap of all of the MSBA modules and inserted um, stopping points along the way where we would have community forums. We worked together to craft um, the, the um, the actual structure of the building committee itself. We worked on identifying the people that would fill that job. And I think we've got a great group of people. They're working tremendously hard. Um, again, I've attended, I did miss one of the forums because I was out of town, but I've attended all of the forums. I follow their meetings. Um, certainly, we have a report. John gives us a report every meeting and um, ask a lot of questions. I think in particular, what I've been able to do positive and negative is provide the, the institutional history of what went wrong the last time and how we can do better the next time and we must do better. Um, we particularly focused quite a bit on strengthening our two-way communication and I certainly agree with both Brian and John that that is the greatest thing that all of us can do is continue to communicate. Um, the, I've worked, I've spoken with the communications chair of the ESPC at length about how we communicated the last time, what was successful um, about that, and where I thought that we could, you know, where where the feedback was that people didn't care for this avenue or that avenue. So, so again, I agree. Communication is the most critical thing from here going forward, um, and clearly, all of us are committed to uh, to making sure that that happens. All right. Thank you. And you can sit down momentarily. <laughs> Now it's time to move on to the final segment of this evening's forum, when the candidates have the opportunity to address the audience with closing remarks. Once again, there's a two-minute time limit. And for the closing statements, we will reverse the order from the opening. So if the candidates for Parks and Recreation Commission will go first, beginning with Robert Dubinsky, candidate for a three-year term on the Parks and Recreation Commission. Thank you again, Nancy, and I want to thank uh the Women's Club at HCAM once again for hosting this event. Um, in closing remarks, I'd like to go back to something that Mr. Weissman uh, asked about our enterprise fund. One thing I alluded to say is our Park and Rec Commission, which I'm very proud of, I, I don't think there's been a better com commission in my tenure, uh, is responsible for the maintenance on the common, responsible for a number of fields in town that really don't generate any revenue. So the, the cost of that maintenance we as a commission are very careful not to burden all our participants, our basketball players, our soccer players, our lacrosse players, with those funds. To go a little further into our proposal at Fruit Street, which is the outdoor pavilion the, to protect the, the players when there is inclement weather, uh, the restrooms, which we everyone knows there's 
great number of girls that play up there, and those porta potties really aren't the best for them. So that uh, structure would also have men's room, ladies' rooms, men's rooms, and a concession stand, and a large storage area. So we would be able to go ahead and alleviate those uh, not not so pretty trailers that are up there. As a commission, we've gone ahead and been back in contact with CDM. They were the folks that originally did those plans. They're uh, intimately knowledgeable of the project going forward. And at town meeting, uh, through CPC funding, over bonded over a 10-year period, we're requesting a half million dollars. We'd like to encur encourage everyone uh, to come out to the town meeting to uh, either support us or, or, or let us know your concerns so we can continue to serve the community. And, a, and again, a property that we were one of two groups after the town purchased it that developed it. The wastewater treatment plant is up there and Park and Rec is up there with some fields that everybody's enjoyed. Okay. Closed remarks can continue to support the Park and Rec programs and our ears are always open. Thanks. All right. And Robert McGuire, candidate for one unexpired term on the Parks and Recreation Commission. Nancy, I'd like to start by thanking you for being the moderator tonight. I'd like to thank HCAM and wish the Hopkinton Women's Club a happy 95th birthday. Uh, and I look forward to, uh, I've been on the, on the board for six months. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I'd like to continue on the board. It's exciting. I think I can be helpful to the board. Uh, we've got some tr tremendous programs, and honestly, a lot of that has to do with the, the parent volunteers with, uh, like, for instance, in the soccer, Amy Mick and, and Tom Skiba, uh, Fran Young on the baseball, uh, Karen Rudden, Karen Ford, and uh, Colleen Allen on uh, uh, ladies lacrosse, Kyle Kelly on, on men's lacrosse, and um, can't forget Jerry Sparr, who spends a tremendous amount of time on the basketball. It's because of people like that that the programs succeed. Um, so our goal will be to continue improving programs, look for other programs that people might be interested in, and uh, I ask you to vote, come out and vote May 18th, excuse me, and be uh, appreciated if you could consider me for the position. Thank you. And Laura Hansen, candidate for the one unexpired seat on the Parks and Recreation Commission. Thank you for having me tonight and uh, congratulations on 95 years for the Women's Club. That's great and thank you to HCAM. Um, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to participate in my community's uh, politics and I'm learning a lot and I think I bring a fresh uh, approach to uh, things where I'm very receptive to community input. Um, I realize how important it is to have parental support and guidance in the direction of the planning of the uh, Parks and Rec's goals and visions. Um, I think they do amazing things for this community, uh, not only with sports, but with the community and the town in general for all ages and uh, I would be honored to be a part of that process and I will look forward to serve uh, the interests of the community as best I can. Thank you. Brian Karp, candidate for school committee. Thank you, Nancy, and the Women's Hopkinton Women's Club. I'd also like to thank uh, Ms. Birchman and Ms. Mr. Graziano, the people here at HCAM, as well as the residents of Hopkinton who are here in the studio and those at home watching on TV or online. There's been a lot of coverage recently about the effects of stress on teenagers and students. We've done a great job in high school with our de-stress weeks, but why are we not vetting our policies, training, and programs before they're being implemented? I will work for families to make sure that the traditional holidays are returned to the calendar as days off. Hopkinton is a multifaceted community, and by removing those holidays, there, the school committee has excluded a certain um, a, a selection a section of our community from being able to participate in school they've created stress for these students they've created stress for these families the students need to determine whether they go to school and miss out on celebrating their hol their holiday with their families or that do they celebrate their holiday with their families and miss out on school work as uh, another for another thing uh, a parent of a middle schooler told me that when their child uh, asked their teacher for help recovering a saved project on, on a computer with this one-to-one -one program, um, which was valued as a, this project was valued as a test grade. The student was redirected to another teacher because their teacher didn't know how to help them. The, stu the student was actually redirected to three different teachers. They also sought out help from other students. 
It was never recovered, and it caused them to have to perform live, creating another form of stress on the student and on the family. Before we roll out new technology and new programs and new policies, we need to make sure that everything has been vetted and the teachers and administrators get the proper training that they need to in order to support our students. When you go out to vote on Monday, May 18th, please ask yourself if you want to have more of the same business as usual approach, our school, the way that our school committee has been conducting its business, or if you want some change. If you're ready for change as I am, please vote for me, Brian Carr. Thank you. And John Graziano. So thank you, Nancy. Thank you again to the Women's Club and HCAM for providing this, this forum for us. Thank you to all the residents who came out watching on television, those who will watch the recorded version, and those who provided questions. Thank you to all the candidates who came out and who volunteer their time. Um, three years ago, when I decided to run, a friend of mine who doesn't live in Hopkinton said, well, if you're going to run for office, the first thing you've got to be able to answer is why. And so I thought about that a lot when I decided to run for re-election. And what it comes down to is I love this town. Um, I love the people in this town. I love the engagement in this town. I, I love how much people want to be here. I, I love how proud people are to say they're from Hopkinton, and I'm proud to be from Hopkinton. And it's important to me to be a contributor to, to help continue to make this a town that we can all be proud of. Um, I'm looking forward to continuing the work that, I, that the committee has started in, three, in the last three years. Um, I'm, if you can't tell already tonight, I'm passionate about the work of the elementary school building project. Um, I'm as passionate about the process that we've gone through as I am about the output. Um, I want to continue that project and I want to have the opportunity to see it to the end. Um, I, I've also really, uh, I, another, I'm also really proud of the work we've done within the district in collaborating with Dr. McLeod. Um, and I look forward to the partnership over the next three years to help bring the shared vision of the administration, the school committee, and the community to life for what, the, what 21st century education can continue to be for Hopkinton. Um, I look forward to continuing to see the results that we have from some of these initiatives that we have enacted and some that we will enact to improve learning for our students and be able to see individual student progress and see all of our students get the most out of their educational experience. Um, and I look forward to seeing the, the financial results of those initiatives because I fundamentally believe they will reduce our costs over time. Um, I, I thank you again for your time. I thank you for your, for your support over these last three years. And I respectfully ask for your vote on May 18th. I'm Jean Birchman, candidate for school committee. Okay. Well, and again, I would like to thank the Women's Club and HCAM uh, for making this evening possible and Mrs. Clark for hosting every year. Um, and balancing all the juggling that, that we do up here. Um, I would like to thank Mr. Karp and Mr. Graziano for an enlightening debate and the audience for some very illuminating um, questions. So thank you all. Community engagement is clearly a vital part of what, make, make, what makes Hopkinton such a special uh, place to live. As a community, it is our responsibility to provide an education to our children. Our town was founded by Harvard to support the education of young students. 300 years later, Families still move to Hopkinton because of the wonderful character of our community and the strength of our educational system. I am enormously proud of the value that the school district continues to provide the town in terms of a high quality education at a reasonable cost to the taxpayers, and I truly appreciate the continuing support that the town gives to the schools. It is a collaborative effort, and I feel that we've made tremendous strides by working together. And as a volunteer focused on the education of our students, I would be remiss if I didn't close by imploring you all to educate yourselves on the issues and on the candidates. Take advantage of programs like this offered by HCAM. There are multiple um, opportunities over the rest of this week to find out about the issues facing us at town meeting. Pick up your book at town, uh, at town hall and read the Warren articles. Prepare your questions and get them answered before you get to town meeting or on town meeting floor. Please attend the town meeting and the elections and let your voice be counted. Please join me in voting to support Article 43, which is to purchase the Irvine property to house a replacement for the center school and to support the school committee's capital articles, which are Articles 23 through 28. It has been a true privilege for me to serve the town as a member of the school committee for the last six years. I would be honored if you would allow me the opportunity to continue that service for another term by casting your vote for me again on May 18th. Thank you very much. And Frank Durso for the planning board. Thank you. Well, I'm running out of post, so I, I can 
thank you guys in advance for another further five years on the planning board. Um, I want to invite you all to a cleanup day we're doing, a green up day. Uh, I think that you're co-hosting, right? Uh, the Sustainable Green Committee is doing our sixth or seventh year of the green up. Uh, we're meeting at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning on the Commons. And uh, we invite all politicians that maybe want to meet and greet people that are there. We provide bags and gloves. And from around 9 o'clock to around 10 o'clock, we uh, gather around and, and network. And then we go out and hit a specific area or two that really needs uh, cleaning up. So uh, if you're around, if you uh, just want to clean up your own neighborhood, uh, there'll be extra dumpsters provided by Harvey's. And uh, uh, we'll be out there. And if you have any questions, uh, the number's on HCAM uh, for the event. Thank you. And Darlene Hayes for the Board of Library Trustees. Hi. I get to wrap up. And um, I think this panel is cool. Um, and they're all community givers. And I think over and over again, I've heard them talk about education, information, communication. You know where you can get all that? At the library. <laughs> you you, you want to know where the annual report is? You want to know more information on the 60 town warrants? Go to the library. They have them. Support your library. Support the new initiative. Support the history of the 300 years that Jean's been working really hard and Michelle on having this great celebration. The history's there. Um, and as we move forward, the whole new technology, everything else, support your library, support town, and be a community giver and be involved. Thank you. Thank you. And at this point, again, I'd like to have us. Good round of applause. Thank you. On behalf of the Hopkins and Women's Club, I would like to extend a special thank you to the candidates who participated in this event tonight and to our studio audience and television viewers for joining us this evening. I also want to acknowledge the HCAM TV staff and crew for making this broadcast possible and the women's club members and high school students who volunteered tonight. I hope you feel this program has been informative and we encourage all registered voters to vote in our town election on Monday, May 18th. All Hopkinton precincts vote at the middle school between the hours of 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. Absentee ballots are available at the town clerk's office. We invite those of you in our studio audience to join us now for an informal reception with the candidates. Thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.